Hi, my name's Nick Tui from Kew Baptist Church, and I'd love to invite you to journey with us over the next few weeks as we explore and search a really important, though perhaps heavy topic, and that's the topic of death. The great theologian and author N.T. Wright said that from Plato to Hegel and beyond, some of the greatest philosophers have declared that what you think about death and life beyond it is the key to thinking seriously about everything else. Indeed, it provides one of the main reasons for thinking seriously about anything at all. In a world where currently, as of this very moment, 152,214 people have died from coronavirus, I want to invite you to hear what Christianity says about humanity's biggest question, death and beyond death. It's good news and I invite you to join me with the hope and the life and the truth of the gospel over the next few weeks. Hope to see you online. That video, I don't mind, I'm quite proud of my grey streak. I think grey hairs are, are, are sincerely a sign of wisdom and, uh, and authority. Uh, so, um, nonetheless, uh, good to be here bringing this word tonight. And I want to thank you for joining us and uh, being part of this gathering. The topics that we're dealing with, at one hand, seem rather immense. Uh, death and life beyond death. But on the other hand, as N.T. Wright has said, I mentioned in that video, that, that all the kind of great and significant philosophers down through the age have, have, have kind of landed on death and said that the way we think about it, the, the, the seriousness that we give to it, uh, will, will help give us clarity in all the other questions of life and all the major things of life. And when we did that video about a week ago, I mentioned 152,000, and it's a little bit morbid the way this is tracking John Hopkins University are doing this amazing work with the data. But this was just earlier this afternoon, 202,000. So in the matter of, of one day, oh, sorry, seven days, 50,000 more people have lost their lives through the coronavirus epidemic, and it's only heading up at this stage. So it's a very important uh, moment for us as a community, as a nation, as a world, to be giving attention to death and, and what happens beyond death and to seek answers, to seek clarity, to seek truth. And the, the good news of Jesus, the, the message of the Christian gospel, the, the faith of Christianity, gives really direct, really clear and I believe really truthful answers to these questions of life and death. Uh, last week we looked at the resurrection of Jesus, the, uh, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, this week we're, we're looking at why we die. What is the biblical and theological perspective on death? Uh, what is death? What is it about? And next week, uh, Mark Jelly, one of our team members here, is going to bring the, 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 the message about the good news of Jesus. How does the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus actually save us from death and give us hope through death? Uh, then we're looking at how does the world end? What, what's, what's the biblical picture of, of the end of the world, the, the new heaven, the new earth? Uh, what does that look like? What is that about? Uh, we're going to look into heaven. What does the Bible say about heaven, the, the life beyond death, the kingdom of God. What does the Bible say about that? And if you have some questions or comments, uh, you can text them in tonight. And I think we've got a phone um, back in the office, so I might get Amy to grab that. And, and if you've got a question tonight, maybe at the end for a minute or two, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of deal with a couple. But during the week, we're going to do a podcast after each sermon. And uh, you can get some comments, some questions in, and we can explore the topics even further. So use that phone number there, 0420 543 361, and we'd love to hear from you and get some feedback and some of your questions. Just recapping on, on last week, uh, we looked at the resurrection of Jesus. It was Easter Sunday, I do believe. Last week, the week before was Easter Sunday. Two weeks ago was Easter Sunday. Last week we did an Easter Sunday recap. Um, and we, we looked at four facts, historical fact, that Jesus of Nazareth, he did die, and he was buried in a tomb, historical fact number one. Uh, number two, on the Sunday, uh, he died on the Friday, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Again, a historical fact. Number three, 
uh, different individuals and groups in different places and times experienced uh, appearances of Jesus alive. So it wasn't just like one person came back and said, hey, Jesus appeared to me. Groups of people at different times, large groups, individuals, all had this same experience that the person, Jesus of Nazareth, who they saw die and who they knew was buried in a tomb, appeared to them alive. They spoke with him, they ate with him, uh, they heard him speak. And then fact number four, the original disciples, the 12 or the 11, because Judas was no longer with them, they suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, that they weren't really thinking that this would happen. They didn't have a theology in their Jewish faith that God was going to raise someone from the dead in the middle of time. But yet they came to believe it. And not only that, they came to worship a human being, if, if that's all you think Jesus was, they came to worship him as God. And these were monotheistic Jewish people for whom that would have been blasphemy, punishable by death. So that's, there are a number of facts that we looked at last week. And then I love this quote from Dr. Joshua Swamidas. Uh, he said, The question of the resurrection of Jesus is more like an opportunity to fall in love than a scientific inquiry. The, there is evidence, there is historical evidence that we can look at and work through, some of the facts I've just put there. But the resurrection cannot be studied dispassionately. If Jesus really rose from the dead, it reorders everything. It's just like falling in love. It changes our view of the world. And I think that's a great place to wrap up last week. So tonight I want to look at basically three things, I guess, maybe a few sub-things. But the first one is the birth of death. I thought that was kind of a, a bit of a great play on words there. Thank you. I liked it. The birth of death in the Bible. Death uh, for a biblical worldview isn't something that was just always there. It's always been part of life. It's just a natural part of life. Death is a, foreign, a foreigner, an invader. Death was not there in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created a beautiful, beautiful creation and universe, and he created the human beings to tend this beautiful creation. And there was no death. There didn't have to be death. And this is what the book of Genesis says. The Lord God took the man, that's Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it, to steward the earth, to look after God's beautiful creation. And the Lord God commanded the man, look, you're free to eat. I love that the first commandment in the Bible, actually, is you are free to eat. That is the first commandment in the Bible. If you look at it, you are free to eat. Now, don't take that too far because we need to be good stewards of how we eat and what we eat. But you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Pretty good deal so far. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I think that's still a good deal. It's like all the trees, everything is yours. Everything you see is yours, Adam. It's all yours. There's one tree, there's one area that I don't want you to go near, I don't want you to touch, I don't want you to eat this fruit, okay? Because if you eat this fruit, when you eat it, you will certainly die. Now, I'm wondering if Adam thought of that moment, well, what is death? And I'm sure God explained it to him somehow, God explain what death looks like and what it would feel like. But that was the deal. Now, we kind of, those who've been around church community for a while know the story. The woman, Eve, and the man, Adam, they took the fruit. They listened to this mysterious power of darkness, this serpent figure uh, who lied to them. And they thought, maybe we can't trust God. And they rebelled against the, the loving Creator and said, now let's eat this fruit. We don't want to miss out on anything. And they ate it, and death came in to the creation, to human experience. Now, it's, it's kind of like this. It's not that God created the earth where humans were unable to die. That existed as a possibility. But God created the heavens and the earth in such a way that human beings didn't have to die. And somehow we all got in on this collectively and, and since that time, humanity has experienced death. But it's not just physical death. There's two levels of death in the Bible, at least. One of them is the physical, that physically we, we break down, we die, we decay, ashes to ashes, earth to earth, dust to dust, all that. 
But there's another dimension of death in the Bible, which is spiritual, that human beings have died spiritually. And Adam and Eve were alive spiritually to God. They could enjoy the beauty, the the wisdom, the joy, the, the light, the love of the Creator in a perfect, glorious world and live in that. And they had this spiritual communion and relationship with God, their Creator. And when they fell short, when they sinned, when they disobeyed God, they died spiritually. That relationship was cut off. And since then, the Bible says, it's been cut off for everyone, for, for you, for me, for every person who's born in the world, ever since that time, right up to today, we are spiritually dead. We are spiritually cut off from God. We're physically alive. Now think of it a bit like this. You can be physically alive and yet have a terminal illness. You can be physically alive and have a sentence of death over you, physically. In, in a similar sort of way, though it's not a great analogy, we are alive physically but we are dead spiritually. And Jesus has come to bring resurrection and reconciliation to God through that spiritual death and to bring spiritual life, to reunite us with God. And we're going to look at that more next week. So hang on, um, but let's have a look at a couple of things here about death. Gordon Wenham says in relation to this passage, in one sense, because they didn't die physically, Adam and Eve, we can see that, they were kicked out of the garden, In one sense, though, they did die on the day they ate of the tree. They were no longer able to have daily conversation with God. They couldn't enjoy his bounteous provision. And they they couldn't eat of the tree of life. Instead, they had to toil for food. They had to suffer and eventually return to dust from which they were taken. That was the deal. And that's been our lot ever since. Now, fast forward to the New Testament sometime later. This is after the death of Jesus. I want to read something from the book of Hebrews. And it says this, that Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, spiritual powers of evil, and that Jesus would free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. The Bible's quite clear to say that death is the biggest question humans have to face. And ultimately, it's the thing that humanity is most afraid of. Now, 2,000 years later, anthropologists have done lots of research across tribes and cultures and different uh, times and locations in the world, in the customs and the, the cultural practices of different groups. And they have confirmed this word from the book of Hebrews. Uh, One anthropologist, Ernest Becker, said that the idea of death, the fear of it, haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is the mainspring of human activity, activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, to overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny for man or humanity. And what he's saying there is what is written in the Bible, though he takes it a little bit further and he kind of says all the activity of human beings, all the busyness, all the, all the distractions that we make for each other, at its root, we're really trying to avoid the question of death. We're really trying to avoid the problem of death. Now, I don't agree with that part because I think the book of Genesis showed us that we, in fact, were made to work, to create, to enjoy God's creation, and it wasn't meant to be a distraction from death though he and other anthropologists have suggested that perhaps that is at the root of a lot of human busyness and activity. Now, death is multifaceted. Death is political. You think of it, death is used by tyrants. In the Roman Empire in the time of Jesus, crucifixion was a a death machine. And the Romans used it to say to people, if you want to mess with the Roman Empire, if you want to question the authority of Caesar... This is what might happen to you. Death was used as a tool, and even right down through our own day, various tyrants and oppressive regimes used death as a tool to control people, to oppress people, and to make people live in fear. Death is political, no doubt about it. Death is philosophical. As I've mentioned earlier in the message, all the great philosophers deal with death, the problem of death, the question of death. It's a philosophical question that we have to wrestle with. Death is emotional. It's psychological, it's physical. 
death impacts us in our whole person. Uh, and death is symbolic. It's metaphorical. We might think of things like, uh, you know, the death of my dreams, the death of a relationship. Death is metaphorical and symbolic for us as well. But primarily, death is spiritual and theological. And this is where the answers come for us in the New Testament and the Bible. Death has come through human rebellion from God. When people have turned against God, when we disbelieve, disobey, rebel against God, it leads to death. It leads to all sorts of death, including physical death, but definitely spiritual death. So let's, that's kind of the birth of death in the Bible. It arises through human rebellion, human sinfulness. Let's look at the life of death in the Bible, just for a moment. How does death operate? How is death, what does death mean for us now? What does death say to us now? Uh, and how does the Bible present that? Well, the Apostle Paul, a long time after the Garden of Eden, said about death that, That just as sin entered the world through one man, and he's referring to Adam in the Garden of Eden, and death came through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. Paul is saying that when you see death today, when we experience death, physical death, what what we need to be reminded of is that this, this death is present because human beings have said to God, we can't trust you. We don't believe you. We're not going to do what you say. We're going to rebel against you. That death continues to have a life of its own in the world in a way that reminds us and is supposed to speak to us about our rebellion, about our disconnection from God. That death still plays that part. And Paul says that it's human sinfulness, it's rebellion, it's, it's the, the greed, the violence, the hate, the, the things of humanity that that we submit to and and fall prey to, the the sinfulness that leads to death. And when we see death, when we experience death in our culture, when we see it around us, it's meant to remind us, aha, this is what happens when people rebel against God. And it's meant to sober us and it's meant to wake us up. In other parts of the Bible, uh, God talks about death in these sorts of ways. He says in Isaiah The prophet Isaiah says, All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, um, it it fades and surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So that the impermanency of life, the the mortality that we experience, um, is meant to remind us of, of our finiteness. It's meant to point us upwards to God who is infinite, who is eternal. We're meant to be sobered by death. Uh, God allowed death to come in for a number of reasons, but one of them for this reason, to to make us aware of the consequences, the the results of rebelling against God, of calling God a liar. And Psalm 90 says it this way. I love this, uh, the whole psalm, but this part in particular. The, the psalmist, it's the, the prayer of Moses, and he's praying to God, and he says, God, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. You sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new, but by evening, it is dry and withered. And there's a sense of heaviness with these texts, but it's meant to be heavy. It's meant to make us feel like, Yeah, death isn't meant to be part. It's not just natural. It's not just, yeah, part of life, death, just accept it. No, we're meant to feel this, I don't want to die. I don't like death. I often say death is really inconvenient. It always comes at the wrong time. There's never a good time for death to come. And in the Bible, the life of death continues to say to us, be reminded, O mortal, be reminded, human being, of your finiteness, of your limited life, and look up. And return to your Creator. Cry out to Him. Seek Him. That's the continuing life of death in the Bible. And then there's the the death of death in the Bible. This is the third thing, and we'll look more at this next week. But it doesn't just end in death. Death comes in. Death has a continuing way to remind us of our need for God, to, to cry out to Him, to be humble, to seek Him. But death doesn't have the last say in the Bible. Death actually dies one day. 
God will kill death. He will end death once and for all. And the life and the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of the death of death. Now, Paul says it like this in the letters to the Roman, to the Roman church. If we've been united with Jesus in a death like his, that is, if we identify with him, if we believe in him, if we accept him and receive what he's done for us in his death for us, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's the hope, that Jesus dies. He dies for us. He, he dies to take into himself the death, the, the punishment, the suffering that, that we deserve for our rebellion. And Paul says, if you unite yourself with Jesus, well, God raised him to life. He overcame death and you too will overcome death. You don't have to fear death at all. You don't have to be afraid in any way. So back to that Hebrew scripture I shared at the start. Jesus shared in our humanity that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil, the powers of evil. And that he would free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now, I want you to just think for a moment um, of the concreteness of death and the way death impacts our lives. People at different ages are going to think about this differently. If you're like 21, you're like, I'm not really thinking about death. I'm just getting my life going here. That's okay. But if you're, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, you're going to be perhaps thinking a bit more along those lines and you're going to be glad you got to live that long anyway. But I want us to think for a moment and just feel the sting of death. And, and I think it brought it home to me last Thursday. We're here in Kew, the suburb where our church is. Four police officers were, were mown down in a terrible, tragic accident. And investigation is still ongoing, but it's just a series of events that happened that led to this chaotic and uh, tragic scene where these four innocent police officers who were going about their work were, were killed pretty much instantly in this accident. And in the paper that uh, yesterday, I think it was, in The Australian, uh, there was a little story about one of the families, and it was Officer Josh Presney and, uh, and his family. That was a photo of them. Josh is on the right next to his dad. And I couldn't help my heart just bled, and I... I I sat with tears in my eyes just imagining the pain of this family and this is what his parents said. The thought of never hearing his guitar playing throughout the house, never sharing our sporting adventures together again, never going to the football with him again, never laughing over silly family jokes with him again, breaks our hearts and fills us with such pain that it has taken our breath away. And I thought, what a profound and, and deeply moving description of what death does to us. How it said to me so strongly, you're not meant to experience this. You're not meant to know this loss and separation. God never intended for us to know this level of pain and this level of loss, it's not meant to be part of our experience. And you see it here in this family. I've done so many funerals over the years and see the, the pain, the, the loss that death brings. It was never God's intention. But God has acted. God has moved to, re to reverse death and to give us hope beyond death. So it doesn't have to be the end. It doesn't have to be that separation that they're experiencing here. They, I don't know what their faith is, but everyone can have the hope of resurrection, of life beyond this life. And I love what C.S. Lewis said. And I think whether you're a believer, a follower of Jesus or not, you should want the message of Jesus to be true. You should want the message of the Bible to be true. And C.S. Lewis says, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And I think of that in regards to death. This poor family and so many people who, who lose loved ones, for ourselves who will one day die, we, we long for that not to be the end. We long for death to not be final. We long for life to go on beyond death. We long for a union. We long to hold our loved ones again. We, lo we long to see them again. Maybe that longing exists, says C.S. Lewis. 
Because that world exists and that possibility exists. And it exists in Jesus and his life and his resurrection. At every funeral I do, I start every service with these words. Jesus said, this is to Martha and to Mary who just lost their brother Lazarus Lazarus, a few days before. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they physically die. There's the spiritual and the physical. The one who believes in me, a spiritual life with God, even though they physically die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die spiritually. And God will raise them up again. We'll learn more about that in the next few weeks, about resurrection. And then he says this question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And I read this at every funeral. And it's so wonderful when I know the person is a believer, a a follower of Jesus, and I can read this with confidence and say, they are dead to us here today, but they are very much alive with God right now, more alive than they've ever been. But the question I leave you as the team comes up, the question that I ask you, I ask myself, death, beyond death, what do you believe? Death ultimately is the great test of every worldview. Whatever you believe, when we die, you'll find out whether your belief is true or not. I'm inviting you to put your trust and your faith into Jesus, who has said these words. This is his claim. The one who believes in me will never die. The one who believes in me will live, even though they physically die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I invite you, if you are a believer, to have this hope, to share this faith, this good news with others. I invite you, if you don't believe, what have you got to lose? Believe and trust in this Jesus who said these words and three days after he died, his disciples and followers experienced him alive. And you too can know that life and that joy that he gives now today through his spirit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. That yes, death is real. But death is not just a natural part of this world. It's not something that was meant to be. Lord, it's painful. It hurts. We can be afraid of it because we weren't meant to know it. We weren't meant to experience it. And Father, we pray for those who are listening tonight, for those who will listen to this, for those in our own lives who have recently lost loved ones. Lord, for those who themselves are held captive by the fear of death. Father, we pray for the hope of the resurrection and the life of Jesus to be with them, to be with us, that we can have the confidence and the assurance that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that as we trust Him, as we believe Him, as we follow him, as we love and serve him, one day we too will be raised to life. That death has no power over us. Death no longer has its sting. Because, oh God, you have conquered death and the grave. Jesus has risen from the dead. And I thank you, Lord, that we are your sons. We are your daughters through faith in Jesus. That you've brought us spiritual life spiritual reconciliation through Jesus and that even though we physically die still we can come to know you and be spiritually alive through faith and trust in Jesus so Lord we offer you our lives we pray for strength to share this message to share this good news with our friends our family we pray that this hope would give us a foundation that we don't need to fear death we don't need to ignore death either but we can trust that in Jesus, the one who has risen from the dead, that you too will raise us to life in him. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.